Ladies and gentlemen, may I ask you to stand up, please? Please be seated. Good afternoon. After the opening words of Mr. Klaus Huber van der Hoek, Vice President of the Board of Stendon, Mr. Robert Coonan, Dr. Robert Coonan, will have his inaugural speech. And then the formal appointment will take place, subsequently followed by the Laudatio by Mr. Rudolf Nijenbanning. Can I give the word to Mr. Klaus Huber van der Hoek? Thank you, Mr. Mulder. Dear distinguished guests, dear heads of school, dear deans, dear colleagues, ladies and gentlemen, dear Dr. Robert, Robertus Johannes Koelen, and dear family. It has to be a token uh, that my notes for this speech are written on a paper of our learning company, My Stenden Pond, which is our learning company at Port Alfred, South Africa, one of our Stenden International Brands campuses. Today, it's a day of joy, the inauguration of Robert Cullen. I will discuss with you three questions. The first question, why a chair of internationalization of higher education? Second question, why this chair at Stenden? Third question, why Robert, why Robertus Johannes Koelen? The first question, why a chair of internationalization of higher education? Universities of applied sciences have three main tasks by law, by Dutch law in this case. Education, research, and valorization of the results of education and research. We as Stenden started in 2001 with the first lectorate and now we have 15 lecturers chairs in our, uh, uh, in our seven schools. And we have decided to install lecturers in line with the three standard pillars, which are internationalization, problem-based learning, and research. In our vision, internationalization is part of academics, it's not separate of academics, and it's not a hobby of university, uh, university boards. In our region, we have learned from Erasmus in the Middle Ages, and even closer in the north of Holland, before him, Agricola, that education and research and knowledge is cosmopolitan. And in our institutional plan, which I brought with me to show to you, we are very proud of it, International uh, Institutional Plan 2013-2017, it's called Worldwise. We have written, education and research are given an extra dimension due to the rich intercultural environment of standing. Internationalization thereb uh, thereby realizes substantial added value for education and research at Stenden University of Applied Sciences. It creates an inspiring breeding ground for the development of the students in their disciplines and as human beings. Internationalization and interculturalization are not so much about travel as they are about learning to cooperate with people from different cultures and backgrounds. Our students 
learn to look beyond their own borders and to adopt an open approach to the unknown. These are formative and significant experiences that enrich the students as a human being and as a potential employee, something that is also referred to as a German term, Bildung. So that is about the question, why a chair about internationalization of higher education? Then, why this chair at Stenlen? It's because, because of our dream is to educate our students for their industries as international, intercultural, and even cosmopolitan employees. To be one uh, education, uh, to be one family of education and research, as it, is, as it was in the ages of the grand, so-called grand tour. And as you know, Stenlen is linked to the concept of the grand tour. And that is a classic, yet innovative, an example in the field of internationalization. And the Grand Tour of Stenden offers Stenden students, staff and industry the opportunity to become part of the international network of our international branch campuses, which related, uh, to related to Stenden. Its network literally provides international knowledge circulation between people, programs and companies. We offer a structured international, intercultural and safe learning environment in a very different places and uh, diverse societies. It's for a good reason that the Standard Grand Tour refers to the age in which the classical Grand Tour was invented, so to say, the Renaissance. The cosmopolitan attitude was then, and even now, considered extremely important. It's ensured renewal as well as economic, artistic, and cultural success. The Grand Tour is one of Stenden's unique selling points we wish to nurture and consolidate it. Because of these developments, we decided in our worldwide, in our policy paper, institutional plan, Stenden will also set up a research unit for internationalization which we do today. Doing so, we are very unique in a higher education, and in the same time, we assure the continuity of the work of, for example, Hans de Witt and other colleagues in the Netherlands who are holding shares at different universities. So that's an answer to the second question. Why at Stenden? The third question, that's interesting as well. Why Robert? You could suggest as a guest here that is because of the fact that the guy has the most air miles <laughs> of not only Stenden employees, but also of all his colleagues, at least in the Netherlands and maybe all over the world. Or because he has uh, he has a very enthusiastic Indonesian wife who, uh, who, uh, by whom he learned uh, Bahasa Indonesia. But no, I'm kidding now, of course. We have the expert in the field of international education in Robert. And he experienced not only in Holland, and he went on the age of 18, or 17, 18, okay, he was already adult, uh, 18 to Australia, Southeast Asia, and back to Holland again, Leiden and Stenden, and now in Qatar. So that's the third question, that's the third answer to the third question, why Robert? Summarizing, the reason for the chair, first of all, Stenden is interested in research in the education and in the work fields and especially in internationalization. And Stenden has a unique selling point in its IBC, International Brands Campuses, and in the Grand Tour. And last not least, the reason is we have Robert Johannes, Robertus Johannes Kuhlen. 
I hope that we, from my pond, my pond in uh, Port Alfred, from Stanton University Hotel in Leeuwarden, from Bali, from Bangkok, Doha, Emmen, Meppel, Assen, and Leeuwarden, we will enjoy the fruits of this unique share. Thank you very much. We just have to cope with um, something technical, but we've rehearsed it, so all things being equal, this will work just fine. Just bear with me for two seconds. I was told I need to watch a couple of things on my screen. You won't see it. Um, this looks all right to me. So, and we'll get to this later. I've got a very interesting um, task today because some of you in the audience will have done um, internationalization of higher education for almost all of your lives, and certainly some of you longer than me. So in a way, I'm um, the little boy who's seen the water come out of the tap, and I've got a few Noahs in the audience who've seen these big gushes of water. That's one. The other is that for some of you, this is a totally new area. And so somehow I have to present a blend that'll put some of the old um, internationalization at, in higher education people almost to sleep, I hope not, um, because right at the end I've got some new, I hope, new tidbits to keep you entertained as well. Um, but I'm going to um, uh, divide my talk in a few areas. I'm going to talk briefly about globalization, and you may well ask, what's that got to do with the price of eggs? I'm going to talk briefly about the development of the middle classes globally. And again, I'll explain why I'm doing that. There is, since 2011, there is a debate on are we going in the right way with our internationalization? I will touch on that. And then I'm pushing for my proposal uh, um, for a, a learner-centered definition of internationalization of higher education. And then uh, I'm going to repeat some of what Klaas Wiebo said about whether or not Stenden is um, fit for purpose and, and what research I'll touch on briefly. Good, globalization. Um, what's that got to do with the future of uh, education? And in fact, globalization is why we think internationalization as our response to the upmarch of globalization, as our response is what we need to um, uh, understand. Now, my definition of globalization, and there is, of course, books written on it, but I'll keep it simple. Globalization is the penetration of goods, services, people, ideas across the border. Simple. And so it also means, a uh, um, point taken, that uh, it, the, the activities of internationalization in themselves can be also globalization. So, we are preparing our graduates for the workplace, for their time after they've studied with us. And if globalization is such an important force, we must somehow prepare our graduates for that. And this is why I think globalization is important. Now, just as one measure, again, I can show you very many, but one measure, you look here at a graph that's going up. One is air freight and the other is passengers. So I'm part of that graph, uh, according to Klaus Wiebo, having done all these air miles. Um, that's going up and up and up and up and up. That's telling us that people moving, goods are moving, and of course with people come ideas, and with uh, today's technology, the ideas get around the world even faster than we can. So... In effect, globalization causes us to become connected to people who may be geographically or culturally distant from us. And I've got here a few examples. You all, knew, uh, you all know how the Arab Spring started with the Tunisian vegetable merchant who got sick of all the harassment by the so-called authorities and, um, and set himself alight. That started the Arab Spring. Uh, the fact that there were bad and doubtful mortgages in the US affects you and I today. So we're really, we're really extremely connected. And if you, I don't suggest you really do it, but if you were to look at the labels 
on your clothes, I dare say that there will be almost nothing made in the Netherlands and almost everything made in a number of developing countries. So globalization makes us all connected. Now, why do I talk about the middle classes? Well, that's very simple, and I go grab back to the definition. Again, books have been written about what constitutes the middle class, but I take a very pragmatic view here, um, uh, um, given to me by uh, Caras and Pezzini, that the middle class, they're people who have a stable work situation, they'll enjoy a pension, they have a stable home situation, Oh, by the way, my kids want some good education, um, I want good health care, and I've got money to spare for um, leisure and buying things. That's a simple definition of middle class. And one element of this, the fact that they um, want good education for their children, is in fact a major motor in the development of education on a global scale. And it's not just any old education. The demonstrations in Chile in the middle of 2011 were about not just getting access to education, no, it had to be of good quality. So uh, people become more and more vocal. I can show you many graphs to um, demonstrate the growth of the middle classes, but I've borrowed Hans Röhrling's technique, which is a number of uh, ball <coughs> graphs, and what I'm going to show you is, um, I've got a few of these little balloons. On this particular axis, vertically, I'm going to show you what the different middle class groups are spending. On the horizontal axis, I will show you the proportion they are of the global middle class. And then um, the size of the bubble is the actual size of the middle class in that region. And I'm, what I'm showing you here is Europe, how it was in 2009, and we have about 36% of the global middle class. Asia Pacific in 2009 was 28%. And I'll just show North America as well in 2009 with 18% of the global middle class. Now these predictions are World Bank data. They're not my own, they're World Bank. I'm just borrowing them. And what we're going to do, I'm going to let this run and you will see how the proportion of the global middle class and their spending power, how that changes between now and 17 years from now, 2030. So when I set this into motion, you'll see this move from 2009 where we are now to 2030. And this is what will happen according to the World Bank. Um, you, you can see it. I've not highlighted some of the smaller bubbles, South America, uh, Sub-Saharan Africa, MENA, but I've just focused on three areas. And your concept of where the center point of gravity financially, the center point of gravity in terms of people who decide they want good education, they want good health care, that's going to lie not where we are used to. Uh, obviously, if I change this um, spending into the actual size, you see that the per capita spending power of um, North America and Europe per person, they have more to spend, in Asia a bit less. Nevertheless, it's just an overwhelming situation where 66% of the globe's middle class will be in the Asia-Pacific region in 2030. Okay, we can leave this and we go back to um, our presentation. So for me, it's a metaphor. For me, it says, okay, what's happening in this world? How will it look in 15 years' time? And I think it will be a very different place. And for that very different place, we have to educate our students. Who is going to be serving who? Who has the financial power? Um, with whom do we have to interact? So, internationalization, is it worth really worrying about? At the national level, um, in Australia, we always bemoan the fact that the government wasn't interested in our international students. And then one day they woke up, because all of a sudden, international education as an export became bigger than tourism, per se. And a lot of government resources went into underpinning this. 
Australia's had some troubles recently, just like the UK, with some hiccups with border crossing and Australia with some uh, trouble with uh, Indian students and numbers have gone down a bit. What's the response of the government? We're going to turbocharge it. Or the UK, we're going to start a new initiative because we want so many more students. It's pure export industry. Now that's for universities who are cash-strapped, an, an interesting solution to their problem. There's even supranational uh, interest. The EU now has a strategy and um, um, to combat the unevenness of distribution and to set up Europe to be able to compete with the other parts in the world to get the talent to come here and give us a chance to build knowledge-based economies. Um, what about the institutional level? Far more important for us working um, at the institutional level. And you heard it, um, Klaus Wiebel just alluded to it, uh, there's lots of statements in strategic documents of universities. They all boil down to, we want to make sure that the students who finish studying with us are ready for a world in which, one way or another, you're going to have to interact with people from other cultures who may be from very far away or nearby but have very different ideas about um, their life and how it should be. Um, what it boils down to, is that we need to worry about the intercultural competence of students and their international awareness. And um, what I'm going to do now is um, uh, um, just zoom in on how do you get institutions to work on this and how do you get them to actually prepare themselves to be able to give graduates that what we want them to have so that they can cope with what they need to do. So, I talked about Australia, they, they went from aid to trade. In the 1950s, the ministers of the Commonwealth got together and said, we need to help our Commonwealth brethren who are not so well endowed, so we need to help them with educating their people. That's how it started. And in the late 80s, Australia said, by the way, you can also invite other students, not government supported, and 